All right, Trevor. You're going to be first up here. Oh, you get started? Yeah, you're going to talk about the attendance calls. Okay. okay. So, uh, as many of you probably know, we, we roll out an attendance policy that's going to be effective April 1st, almost everything else. And uh, let me just, I guess, give you kind of a forward for why we're doing this. The main reason is that we actually had some staff come to us and they were very concerned about the fact that um, some people that called in sick were doing it too often and it was creating a real burden, a real problem for them. And so they, they felt like they were um, getting burned out basically because they had more work to do because of the people that they had to cover for. And so we thought long and hard about it and decided that we would uh, come up with an attendance policy. And the attendance policy is, I hope you'll look at it as not being a punitive type thing, but more of a, a deal where we have the tools we need to, build, to, to deal with the problem that we've had in the past. And so with the attendance policy, I'll go through it and, and explain it, um, but I really hope you'll look at it that way. There's gonna be points involved with the attendance policy so you can get You'll, you'll get points if you have too many occurrences. Um, and we just ask that you, you know, just because you get points, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily on a, a red list in the HR office that you're heading out. You know, it's, it's something that if, even if you uh, get sick, you may get, you may get some points, but uh, don't look at it as, as something that's gonna move people out of the organization. It's really something that we can track the attendance and, and make sure that those people that are abusing it are held accountable for their actions. So, any questions before I get started about why we have an attendance policy? Okay. So, um, just a couple of definitions to go through. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, tardy would be showing up to work more than seven minutes beyond the start of the scheduled shift. Um, an absence would be notification with less than 24 hours notice of not covering your scheduled shift. And then an unexcused absence would be notification with less than 24 hours notice and not finding coverage if applicable. So if you had, if you need to have somebody cover your shift and you didn't do that, that would be an unexcused. A missed punch, any instance where you fail to punch in or out, and let me just say with missed punches, I know there's concern about whether or not the time clocks um, actually capture all the punch punches. I just ask that uh, you just be careful with that and, and watch it. And if you have concerns, talk to your director, um, and, and they're going to be they're going to be able to help you. You know, understand the the policy and, and help you realize that it's there's area that we can we can. Um, Work, work with you on this. So, um, no call, no show, failure to arrive to work for scheduled shift without notification to the facility within two hours from the start of your scheduled shift. And then the policy is going to follow a point based system. Um, we'll have corrective action uh, as long as uh, along with constructive discipline. And then points will be removed after six months at the department director's discretion. And it's at the discretion of the department to directly determine if and when discipline will occur or be removed from the employee's file. And really what this is trying to address is the people that call in on Monday morning, oh, I'm sick, Wednesday morning, I'm sick again. You know, it, obviously if you're sick with the flu or something, you might be sick Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but those people that are you know, just calling in here and there and I'm you know, we're, we're, that's what we're trying to address. So, um, the point system: missed punch is 0.5 points, a tardy is one point, absence is two points, unexcused absence is three <coughs> points, and no call, no show is four points. And for as far as the constructive discipline, um, four points would be a, a verbal reminder, six points would be a written reminder, eight points would be suspension or probation, and then ten points would be separation of employment. You know, if you think about uh, what it would take to get to that point, it, it's, you'd almost have to work to do it, if you think about it. <laughs> you'd have to try to, to uh, be terminated based on that. So what questions do you have? 
Is this encouraging people, though, because of the 24-hour notice? Is this encouraging people to come to work when they're sick? Because, I mean, you might wake up in the middle of the night with <coughs> some serious bathroom visitation, and because you don't have 24 hours to notify, no, but you're that's, coming in, and that's... But that's but, but the, prob the problem is that how are you going to decipher if somebody's abusing that or not abusing it? But and and the other thing is, if you're that kind of person that did that once in a year, it's not going to affect you at all. If you did it twice or three times in a year, it's not going to affect you. But when you do it 10 or 15 times, which employees are doing, well, that's excessive. Yeah. Yeah. But if it, but are we encouraging people to to come, come to in work. to come to work when they really probably shouldn't be because no, they can't, can't give 24 hours notice? I think you just realize that just because you get two points, it's not. Uh, it's not the end of the world, you know. You might you might get points, even though you're an excellent employee and you're doing everything you're supposed to. But I realize those points are going to come off in six months. Um, and for most people, it, it's it's the abusers that are going to really be affected by this. Because I personally would rather cover for my coworkers than have them there. Right, and I don't think we want people coming in sick and spreading sickness around. So I don't think we want that. But what we do want. And, and the thing is, like Charlie said, we can't determine whether or not somebody's really sick or they're not sick. And so we had to have something in place that's, it, it might be negative for the, the people that are not abusing it, but for those that are abusing it, it's, it's going to correct the problem. I I what about those of us that have families that I call in sick and I'm sick with the flu and then my kid gets it? Does that mean I got four points because me and my kid have been sick? And I have but, to be gone. You would you would get it for the so for example if you call in sick and you have the flu and you're out for five days, you're not going to get points each day that you. Right, but let's say I come in and I'm sick and I have the flu and I call in, I get two points taken off. Well, the next week my kids got it and I've got to stay home. Yeah, but that's why there's ten before. I mean, th there is that room in there, so. It, it, so it's not per day necessarily. No, it's just for like six months. Yeah. And every six months it can be. Well, I mean, like, is it two, day, two points a day you miss, or just two points if you're like gone four days? Mm -hmm. like per per instance. Per instance. Per instance. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and and they're going to okay. come off after six months. We're, we're really not trying to, to make this negative for those that are not abusing the, the, the attendance policy. It, but what we had happen is we had, we had one, uh, one department that had a thousand hours of sick call in a six month period and the rest of the department was completely burnt out and just frustrated as can be and they, they came to us and they said, can you do something about this? We, we need some help. We have to address the problem. So that's that's why we're looking at this. And I, I really hope that you can see it from our, <coughs> our point of view that we're not trying to make it negative for people that aren't abusing the system. And I think that there's, there's room for those that don't abuse the system. They're gonna be okay. So, yes. If we had a situation, because I know that you said, okay, an absence is the 24 call in, and an unexcused absence, and this may work to that. What if you were able to get like a doctor note and say, okay, I've had the flu, obviously my kid had the flu. So could that change it so you wouldn't get as many points? I mean, I don't, I don't know if that would help. Don't you kind of yeah. think that this is a new policy and it's going to probably have to evolve? Yes, you know, we're going to keep looking at it. And you know, if it doesn't it's work, I'll bet they tweet yeah. it. Maybe it goes to 15 points, or maybe it, you know. Yeah. But I think, it's, I think it's a good start. We, we don't want this to be we negative for, for you. That for, for you, like with your children, we don't want it to be negative for those people that have things come up. I mean, we understand <laughs> that. and and But we've had to do something for those people that are just getting completely burnt out and frustrated and feel like there's there's no there's no way that they're gonna ever get this problem fixed. And I know of people that have been late every day. I mean we pretty much plan on it. When we would have when we would have a report in the break room, we would be sitting in that break room for fifteen minutes waiting for that other nurse to show up. And I mean that costs a lot of time and money. Well, it goes back to the expectation is, I mean, we're trying to run a hospital and we need you to be here or we wouldn't have your position to begin with. So we really need people to show up and be here. 
And we've seen where somebody is called in sick and then you see posted that they're having a party, you know? And it's like, well, what, what kind of control do we have on that? And that's, it's, it was absolutely being abused. I mean, that's the reality of it, and that's not what we want. And I don't think any of the employees want that. I think this is a great start, too. I'm just wondering, is it up to the department director to determine whether someone is tardy? Yes. I think it's by the time clock. But there's the time clock if you have yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We all yeah. come at yeah. different yeah. times. But it, but it depends on your position whether it's really being tardy or not. I think that's what it comes down to. And yeah. the surgery is just different because you come in at different times. But I think so it's. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, two, real quick. Uh, I, I missed the first part. So who gives out the points essentially? Should our the directors. They'll be tracking this and you know, watching this. Okay, so and then my other question is, so sometimes I go to lunch and I forget to clock in. And so, you know, obviously I've missed, missed the punch I've been working the whole time. Am I still waiting to get deducted points? Yeah, I mean, we, we have to have a way to, to keep the people from, that are chronically abusing the system from doing that. And it's only 0.5 points and it's going to come off in six months. So, I mean, but we'll lock in. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Tam, are you going to talk about scholarship funds? Yes, I can. Okay. How many of you have uh, students in high school that are going to graduate this year? If you do have students that are going to graduate this year, or if you have students that are up and coming, um, particularly this year, I have uh, scholarship applications that the, the funds that you've been putting into the foundation for the scholarship fund, those are now ready to go, go back and give out. And we want to encourage people to continue to bring in, you know, to donate the funds so that when your kids are growing up and coming through the school system and are ready to graduate, that they will also be able to have access to those funds. So if you know an uh, employee that has a student that's going to graduate this year, have them come fill out an application. They can come see me. The applications are due to be back on my desk for consideration on April 15th. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Trevor, I guess you're up again. Yeah. You guys will be tired of hearing me speak. So, um, as you know, we have a, a nationwide uh, nurse shortage right now, and it's going to continue to uh, grow. And so, we're looking for nurses, and we're we're really kind of struggling right now. But we we want to reach out to you and, and ask for your help. And so, what we've done for our employees is any employee that refers a nurse and they come and stay with us for a period of six months. Once they've hit that six months, then you as the referrer will get $500 for referring that person. Um, we're talking with our with uh, Chris and some of the other nurses, and they said, you know, why don't we extend this out to the community and get their help as well. And so anybody, not just employees, anybody that refers a nurse that comes and works with us and stays for six months will get $500 and that's to anyone outside of the, outside of the organization, any, anybody that refers a nurse. Um, and also please make them aware that if they come and they stay with us for a period of two years, then they get a $6,000 longevity bonus that, that um, employee, the nurse that comes and stays with us. So, you know, we really need your help and we ask you to, to share this on Facebook or to use social media, whatever you can do to get the word out and, and help us with the, the nursing shortage. It's, it's not something that's going away, going away. We just have to learn to uh, grow with the times and, and, and overcome this and, and get the nurses that we need and, and I think we'll be able to do it, but we need some help. So, the other thing that we wanted to address is the nepotism policy. For those of you that don't know what nepotism is, it's a policy that um, makes it so family members can't work in the same organization. 
And uh, we've had one of those in the past, and we've decided that um, we're going to change the nepotism policy to where if you have a family member that wants to come and work, they can do that, and they can even work in the same department as you, um, just so long as you're not a department director or someone who makes employment decisions. So for example, if you're um, making decisions on, on hiring and um, termination, uh, pays, evaluation, stuff like that, then we wouldn't want that person to be over one of their relatives. But um, if you're a nurse and you have a, a family member that's a nurse and they would be interested in working here, tell them that, they, that there's a chance that they could, they could work here now. So we, we don't want to eliminate nurses, good nurses that uh, could potentially be here with us just because of a, a policy that isn't really working for us. So. Any questions on that? All right, thanks guys. We appreciate any help you can you can give us. So all right, thanks Trevor. You didn't throw anything to you. Yeah. Hey, who's <laughs> yeah. You should have come yeah. Uh physician recruitment update. I I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Amy Tomlinson will be uh, joining us on July twenty first. Uh, so she's an OBGYN physician with about six or seven years of experience, so um, we're really excited to have her come. She's coming from Breckenridge, Colorado, her and her husband, Brett, uh, will, will be here. Um, and he's actually applied for a position at the high school, too, and they're very interested in him. So I, I, it would be good that they, they both seem to find a niche in Star Valley. And, uh, so we're excited about having her join us, and we'll be starting the promotion here in the next uh, couple of weeks, as far as promoting her for that. We are recruiting for a general uh, general surgeon, and that's taking us a little longer than we want, but we have some good candidates that we're reviewing now. Uh, we have somebody we're trying to line up for an outside interview coming up. So we've actually had uh, some interest, and we've had one physician come here, but this wasn't quite the right fit. So we're, we want to make sure it's the right fit before we move forward. So any questions on our doctors? Also, I can just put a plug in, it's uh, Doctor's Day on Saturday. So if you see, if you see the physicians, you know, I mean, thank them for what they do. I mean, they work hard, and uh, so um, let them know that. So. Okay. Matatech update. We don't have Eli or Chad here, so um, but what Eli said earlier is basically uh, we're moving forward. So Tuesday's going to be a big day. But it's also been some big days leading up to it, and uh, there'll be some big days after Tuesday as well. Uh, so, uh, I guess from my perspective, I, I you know, I'm, I'm impressed with with how the, the staff have really engaged in learning the system and, and to be ready. So I know it's a big deal, um, and, but we're getting there. And I think, especially after about two or three months we're all going to look at it and say, wow, this is a great thing to go through, but right now we're not saying that, I know. <laughs> but it will happen. The day will come. And uh, So, construction update. Looks like, uh, Mike, you're up. Thanks, Terry. So I'd like everybody to repeat with me when we're going to do this. I love construction projects. <laughs> You'll know what I mean in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an update about what's going on, uh, the ortho clinic is done. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, although the snow melting off has uncovered a little bit of work out there around that building, but we're excited to get that all cleaned up and the sprinkler system working on the grass planted again. And if you haven't had a chance to go over there and see that clinic, it's, uh, it's nice. And, uh, orthopedic docs are going to love it. Their staff and the patients are going to love it. Uh, we've had some really positive comments about that, so that's a good thing. MRI is pretty much done. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, this UPS building that's south generator building out to the north here that's made a mess in the parking lot all winter is, uh, is in process. We, we got some components yesterday that we've been waiting for and so over the next 30 days that project will kind of get finished off. 
and we've got a bunch of cleanup. We've got to pour some sidewalks around it and do a few things like that. So that will be getting done. Inside the hospital, we're looking at three more kind of miniature projects that we'll be working on. One is in the MOE, the uh, admissions reception area, kind of patient flow area around the uh, ladies at the reception desk. We're going to be doing some construction there to provide some better patient privacy and, and patient flow. So that will be coming up. Another one, if, uh, <clears throat> if you've ever walked by the lab and your eyes have been drawn in the door to see somebody having their blood drawn. How many have ever done that? I think we all have, right? So we're going to try and provide some better patient privacy for the phlebotomy in the lab so that uh, the doors are going to get rearranged and we just have a nicer, more private area for a person to have their blood drawn. So we're working on that. Then down the hall a little ways there, the old uh, dark room that was, hasn't been used for several years now. We're going to convert that into some space for Trevor Spencer for his cardiac echo and cardiac rehab program. It's a perfect size space for his treadmill and, and uh, all the stuff he needs to do cardiac echoes and that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll be working on that project this, sum, this coming summer. Then the, the big project, you've seen the fence go up. I've been teasing the <coughs> folks from PT that their new wellness program is they can't cut through the parking lot anymore. They've got to go around the fence. <laughs> They'll have to walk further now. So, uh, but that, a uh, <clears throat> couple of things going on. They took down some of the parking lot lights today and moving signage, and they're going to be uh, relocating those nice, beautiful Canadian choke cherry trees that are on that driveway. I think we're going to relocate those up here by the care center somewhere so we can still enjoy those. And uh, then Silver Star still has to splice the fiber that is in the middle of that parking lot. You know, we relocated that fiber out into the street, in the curb of the street. We've got to splice both ends. <coughs> out. So they're going to do that tomorrow night at midnight. The electrical contractor is going to start working on the 2nd of April in the hallways of the hospital again. We'll go through that again. They've got to put conduits up in the ceiling. And get ready for the ER construction. So just talking to Mike Kentner about some things that are going to have to go on in the operating room and emergency room in about a month when we shut down the ambulance access to the emergency room. That's going to be fun. I know it's going to be fun having the ambulance come to the front door. We'll have a good experience having to, to work with that. And, uh, and so. Uh, just lots of things going on. I just want to tell everybody thank you for finding a new parking spot. If you were used to parking out there by the helipad, thanks for finding a new spot. I hope you can call it yours forevermore because that lot will be patient parking in the future for the outpatient surgery. So uh, once again, thank you. We're going to see lots of dust and lots of mud and, and lots of stuff going on, but we've got a great infection control plan in place to keep the dust and dirt out of the hospital, so we're excited about getting started on that project. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, you guys are in for a treat. It's the Courage Group. You're up.
We want you to write those up, send them to Trevor, and we'll feature those in the newspaper. So the monthly paper will be about courage. And Trevor, why don't you share what? So we, we didn't want to just have, you know, have everybody share their stories and then not uh, recognize them. So um, at the end of the month, we'll be sharing those stories in the newspaper. And then we'd also like to do some form of recognition for them, whether it's gift certificates uh, to a restaurant, to have dinner. Um, we just want to do something nice to, to, to formally recognize them for their stories of courage. So if you want to, to help somebody get a free dinner, um, Send us a story, and, and we'll get it uh, get it in the newspaper, and and uh, recognize them with the with the gift certificate. So, so courage. Let's turn the lights on for a little bit here. So there are many ways to demonstrate courage. One of those is standing up in front of you in a lion outfit, right, with <laughs> ears on top of my head and pretty hair. Thanks to Chrissy Denson, she says, I can make a main out of you. It's like, okay. <laughs> Winston Churchill said, courage is the most important of all human virtues because without it, none of the other virtues are possible. Theologian Paul Tillich stated that courage is all of the other virtues at the point where they are tested. It takes courage to see your life as an adventure because, by definition, an adventure entails uncertainty and risk. And also a little bit of discomfort. So, right now, I'm on an adventure. <laughs> so I want you to please close your eyes. And I want you to just think about what are some of the biggest fears. You can just pick one that's holding you back from becoming the person that you want to be. Or doing the thing that you really want to do. So, get that in your mind. What is it that's holding you back? Alright, now we're going to give that fear, a picture or a name. I want you to visualize it as an angry, hungry lion that's just prowling the turf between where you are now and where you want to be. Now you can open your eyes. All right, picture. I'm going to teach you how to chase away that lion so that you can reach your dreams. Are you ready? So this is what you do. Stretch with and you, hey, you guys gotta come up here. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot. <laughs> okay, so you stretch up, you take a deep breath, and you flex your muscles, and then you jump up and you go, Rawr! <laughs> All right, now did you feel that courage is coming up? <laughs> Some of you didn't feel it. Okay, so we all can stand up now. Mike's not doing it. Hang on. Mike's not doing it. No talent from the front up there. Legs, your muscles, jump up and. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> okay. So, with that, you can chase off those lines of fear, but you know, if you internalize it, <coughs> Just think how you could use it. I mean, you can get the attention of rowdy kids, right? <laughs> or you can maybe help a, a patient conquer their fears. Or <laughs> you can um, <laughs> maybe do that. Of course, you probably are not going to stand up in the middle of a board meeting and, and do that. But you can internalize it and you can think about it and wake yourself up. So. I decided to conquer one of my fears and cut off eight inches of my hair and donate it to Pantene Beautiful Lengths, which um, makes wigs for people who have lost their hair. And this is in memory of my sister-in-law, Kathy Simpson. So, um, anyway, I want anybody who wants to join me, there's different organizations you can donate to. Some take eight, and some take 10, and some take 12. But there's different places that you can donate so that people who have lost their hair can have hair. And some just take it all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the question to all of us today is, are you ready to cut your fears so you can move forward? Me too. I tell my hair go. The first time my heart was just like, how do you do that? 
I'm getting used to it. I'm afraid she's going to punish me, though. Okay, so the first cornerstone of courage is confrontation. And the reason that it is a cornerstone is because you cannot make fear go away. You must confront it with courage. And courage means standing up to fear and not eliminating it. So we got a picture of a cat and a mouse. And the mouse is showing great courage, probably right before it gets eaten. <laughs> um, courage is not an emotion. The real emotion is fear. So courage is what is used to fight fear. The great Nelson Mandela has a quote that I thought was appropriate. And it says, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is he who does not feel afraid, or is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. So, I think what he's trying to say is everybody's scared of something, and the people who say that they're not scared are either lying or they're not smart enough to realize that they're scared. But the real brave person is, is the one who says, I'm scared, but I'm still going to do it anyways. People often react with panic or paralysis in the face of fear. And the thing with these, two, with these two reactions is that they usually cause the situation that you didn't want to have happen anyways. So it's important to, to always remain calm in the face of fear or um, something that scares you. Because if you panic or you are paralyzed, chances are you're not going to get the outcome that you're hoping for. Fear can be more confining than any prison, and confrontation is the first step to freeing yourself from that fear. And this is a guy with a funny nose. I don't know why his nose looks like that, but uh, it was the best picture I could come up with. And he, he is so focused on being in prison, and he's either panicked or paralyzed, and he can't take a step back and look at the big picture and see that if he moved right or left, he would be free. So the best ways to deal with fear is to slow down and take a deep breath, <clears throat> Take a step back and ask what the problem is and if there's a way that I could be free if I stepped right or left. Um, and look at the problem with an objective eye. Put the problem into perspective and ask yourself how big of a deal is it really? And, and take a, a precise measurement of, of the fear and give it a name. So once you give it a name, then it just becomes a problem and it's not something you need to be afraid of. <coughs> <laughs> By fixating on the fears, we may never see the opportunities. And so I put the Meditech icon up here, because that's probably the number one thing we're afraid of in the hospital right now, right? So if we focus, and I'm sure all of us are guilty, myself included, of focusing on the wrong parts of Meditech, and worrying if it's going to work, and worrying if we're going to be able to use the system, or if it's going to just break down on April 1st, or what, what is going to happen. And we really need to be focusing on the opportunities that it, that it gives us. Once the fear is faced, you may learn to enjoy that which you are afraid of. So an example here is riding a bike without training wheels. Everybody started out with training wheels on their bike, and at some point, somebody told you you needed to take the training wheels off and and ride without them. And I imagine that that probably made you fearful. But could you imagine if you were still riding with training wheels? Once you take the training wheels off it, it frees you of a lot of burdens and you can go faster and do more. It's a marked change as in appearance or character. Does anybody think there'll be a marked change in appearance in me with <laughs> <Yes. dishes? laughs> and Usually it's for the better, so, so we'll see. Fear, like Clancy said, is simply emotion. It's an emotional en energy that if it's left unmanaged, then leads to panic, right? Or paralysis. And so if we're fearing something big, then we're, we may not move forward and become what we can become. So once it's been diagnosed and understood, that same energy can galvanize action, and it's usually effective action. So you just gotta put 
put it into the right channel. What are some of your biggest worries and fears? Does anybody have any big worries or fears you want to share? Anybody have any worries or fears with Meditech in this group? Okay. Paula, what do you what's the biggest fear of Meditech that you have? Uh yeah, that everybody's gonna just quit because they can't stand to do it on the computer. It takes way too long to do it. Exactly. So I'm not gonna chart at all. I'll just take care of the patient or I'm out of this hospital. Right? Okay, so that's a very valid valid fear. So that kind of goes along with the fear of failure that we're not gonna be successful with being being able to use the system and take care of our patients all at the same time. Any other fears to go with it? My 16-year-old driving. <laughs> That's a big fear. What do you most fear about your 16-year-old driving? Everybody else on the road. <laughs> you fear that he'll fail? Got it? So I wrote down some, just kind of some universal um, fears that we have. A big one is fear of failure because Nobody wants to fail, right? But the only thing about failure is you know, let's pick yourself up and try again, right? Um, the fear of rejection, that we fear that if we dress up like a lion and act stupid in front of people that they're going to shun us, right? I mean, there's just that fear or of... Or a duck hunter. <laughs> exactly. When we step out of our box of normal, sometimes we fear rejection. But with Meditech... Um, you know, there's a fear of rejection there too, because what if I'm not picking it up as fast as somebody else? And so I fear that my comrade is gonna chastise me or call me stupid or whatever. So what about the fear of change? What is it about change we really fear? The unknown. The unknown, right. It's not really change, because I mean, if we have change and it turns out great, then oh, we all love change. But that fear of that unknown, that uncertainty. So Joe Tai said that we must replace our expectation of something specific to expectancy, which is the acceptance that great things often come in surprising packages and reminds us to be open to the blessings of the unexpected. So I like that. This expectancy, you know something good's going to happen, you just don't know how it's going to come about. Attachment is a big thing. Hope. Let's, we'll finish here. So that's change. And then success. Have you ever thought of fearing success? So if I'm real successful at this Meditech and I learn it really fast, then what's going to be required of me? I got to teach everybody else. It's going to be more responsibilities. What if I teach them wrong? Oh my goodness, you know? So there's different aspects of fear and success. So these are kind of universal things that we might fear in our lives. With attachment often comes fear. The more you're attached to something, then the more you fear because you fear that you're going to lose it. So like me, I'm fearing that I'm going to lose my paper charting because I know when I write, where it's going, that it's going to be there and I'm going to be covered, right? Um, but what about our attachment to what people think of us? Uh, so many times we act, uh, we act in a way because we fear this rejection that we're attached to those. And so, oh, my little papers are over there. Anyway, <coughs> are you ready to cut the strings of attachment? of possessions and receive freedom of movement? And are you ready to cut the strings of attachment to other people's opinions? Oh. And receive freedom of conscience? Oh, here, I don't need this. <laughs> it's better to be a three-legged coyote than a four-legged fur coat. <laughs> do, we have, do we have the courage to um, chew through the paw, uh, the, the traps that hold us back and the fears there. So I've taught you how to release fears with the lion roar, and now I'm going to teach you tapping, which is a much more calmer effect of how to release some fears. So I'm breaking, cutting my uh, fears of how you're going to think about me, and I'm going to teach you something that I've used with my family and with patients uh, to help with fear, with anxiety, and pain and it's been fun. It's been fun. So what you're going to do is hopefully find the little slide that has the picture of tapping. There we go. So I want you to just follow me. And what we're doing is we're tapping on endpoints of meridians so there's energy that runs through you. And as you tap, what it does is it releases those things. 
So you start with negative and then you move to positive. And we're going to use Meditech and we're going to use these things. So the first time you're going to say the same thing about or as we chop, or as we tap on the rotty chop place. Okay? So you use your, your tabs of your fingers up against where you're going to break a board of the rotty chop place. So even though I fear that I'll be a failure at Meditech, now you repeat it. Even you though I fear you. that I'll be a failure at Meditech, I deeply and completely <laughs> love and accept myself. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I fear that I won't be successful with Meditech, even though I fear I won't be successful with Meditech, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Love and accept myself. Even though I fear that my patients, well, what's best to go? Okay, even though I fear that I won't be successful with Meditech, even though I fear that I won't be successful with Meditech, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. All right, now you just say statements. So, I fear Meditech. I fear Meditech. It's going to take too long to, to, to use it and take care of my patients. I won't be able to enter the data correctly. I won't be able to enter the data correctly. I fear that my patients will look down upon me. I fear that my patients will look down upon me. My coworkers are going to reject me because I can't pick it up very fast. My coworkers are going to reject me because I can't pick it up very fast. What if I do pick it up fast? I'll have to teach everybody else. <laughs> They're going to expect so much of me. I just really can't do this. <laughs> Alright, now, your anxiety may have raised or may have gone down. But I want you to, first of all, take a deep breath. Roll your shoulders back and wiggle your feet. Okay, now, your anxiety may have gone up. That means you need to keep talking through things that you're really dealing with. What are your fears? Um, if it's gone down, then once it gets below three on that anxiety scale, then you start tapping positive things. So we're going to do the positive, all right? So on that eye graph, white. I know I can do Meditech. I know I can do Meditech. Computers do not intimidate me. Computers do not intimidate me. Everybody's going to be patient with us. Everybody's going to be patient with us. Everybody knows that we're going to take care of their needs. Everybody knows that we're going to take care of their needs. I can be successful. I can be successful. I look forward to helping others. I look forward to helping others. Change is great. Change is great. I can be successful. I can be successful. Take deep breath. Roll your shoulders back. Move your feet. All right. So now when I see you all tapping, I know you're going a stressful period, like I love construction. I love construction. <laughs> anyway, it's fun and you can use it for all aspects of life. So. <clears throat> okay, so the cornerstone that I am going to talk about is action. I want you to just imagine for a minute that you're in the bottom of a big pit like this one up here on the, up on the PowerPoint. Um, and imagine that uh, you're in the prison of fear. And a lot of times we compare fear to, to a prison, to something that binds us down. Um, and I guess there's really two ways that you can look at your fears. If you can look at it as something that holds you down and, and binds you down, or you can look at it as an opportunity that can motivate you to rise up and face your fears with courage. Um, and then the other thing with this is that uh, the fears can be viewed as, as ropes that maybe you tie around yourself to help you get up out of the pit, but they're not long enough to help you out, and so it ends up holding you back. And so I think uh, you know, as I'm going to show a quick uh, video clip here, and I want you to just watch and think about these different concepts, and then towards the end think of how you can rise up and take action to face your fear with courage. is a spirit, the soul. The soul is a very 
shape is my body. Feel it. That's why you feel it. No, I'm not afraid. I'm angry. Confrontation, action, transformation. I was definitely scared to come and stand in front of you guys and talk to you. So I'm confronting my fears to come stand here. I took action, and now I'm transforming. When I'm done, I'll be transformed. Uh, so what connection is, um, and this was, took me a little bit to figure out, it really means that you care. Um, we're facing a fear of connecting with others. Okay? And... Uh, in our job, we can't have the fear. We have to push that aside. We have to connect with others. We work, you know, right with our patients. And it's a very important thing that we 
overcome. Uh, if you guys remember the movie in uh, Castaway, he lacked that connection, so what did he do? He made another person that he could talk to, and he would talk over and over again with Wilson. In fact, Wilson would talk back, according to him, um, until the, the time that he lost the ball, and then he, he was distraught. Each of us need the connection with other people. Um, I went to the San Diego City and I took this picture of this orangutan with his head in the bag. The funny thing about it was, is he was over in the corner, wasn't going to talk to anybody, and then there were other orangutans out in front of the glass and they were interacting with everybody. And they seemed like they were very happy, but this one, you know, he looks like an orangutan with his head in the bag. Uh, <coughs> so the point of this is just don't keep to yourself. Get out of your uh, comfort zone and say hi to other people. And sometimes that's our greatest fear. I don't know what we need to fear when we are talking to other people. Maybe that we will be judged. Maybe that something's going to um, go wrong when, when we talk to them. Um, but we have to remind ourselves of what? That we care. We actually care about those people, and that that's the reason why we do it. The reason I have an example of a crow and a red-winged blackbird is because that crow tried to get into her nest. And she was going to eat all of her babies, but she cared enough to actually get out of her nest, chase away her fear, which was this bird that was twice her size, and, and move on. As of the same thing that we need to do, we care about those people that we, that we meet. And so we face our fears and stand up for what we believe in. Um, so caring is the root of our courage. We don't care enough about it, do we even do it? We won't. You know, if we don't, uh, if we don't care about our patients, then we'll do a, a half job and, and that will be the end of them. We won't have any more. So it is the root of it. We need to focus on this care and not the fear. It is often the first step to overcoming the barriers that are in front of us. Okay? <coughs> so the barriers we put up, we put up walls. Um, we say, well, somebody else will talk to that person. We don't need to. Um, they'll take care of them. That's wrong. We need to actually build the bridge and uh, span the gap of what we need to, to do to connect with our patients and other people in our facility. This also can go towards being um, interactive with our departments. I mean, there's a lot of people in the, in the hospital that I don't even know. Um, and I hope I'm building that bridge to, to get to know them. Um, a lot of times we stereotype before the, the people that we meet even come into our contact or, or we just meet them and we, we place a label on them before we get too far. We say this person's, you know, uh, this person's too old, you know, this person's too young, this person's too big, tall. However you want to put it, we put a label on them before we even start. And what does that do to our patients? It limits, it limits us to connect with them and it limits us to care because we don't want to, to uh, go any further. How many of you guys remember this situation? You have high school, you probably had your regular cheerleaders, no offense to any cheerleaders here. <laughs> um, or we had the other guy that was picked on in high school that was bullied. Um, we can have that same type of situation in our hospital. There are many different people with different opinions and different uh, perspectives on life. Let's not make ourselves beat up on other people and their opinions just because we think they're a little bit different. Especially in our facility, I, I've heard, you know, a lot of times we get in our ER, we have patients that come in and we say, well, who is this patient? Well, these guys are drug seekers. These guys are this, and these guys are that. But it limits our caring, and uh, we're not allowed to uh, to face that fear of uh, stepping out. Okay, so I've got a few tips from uh, a little guy who's got a lot to say. I don't know if you guys have ever watched him. He's kind of a funny. Twenty things we should say more often. Number twenty. Thank you. And not just on Thanksgiving, every day. Number 19, excuse me. Number 18, here's a surprise corn dog that I bought you because you're my friend. There'll be more corn dogs, more happy people. This is a good idea. Corn dog for you, corn dog for you, corn dog for you. Number 17, I'm sorry. Number 16, I forgive you. Number 15, you can do it. But don't say it if it's something I can't do. Number 14, another thing that we should say more often, I have barbecue sauce in my shirt too. Before you say something about the barbecue sauce on somebody else's shirt, take a look at the barbecue sauce on your own shirt. Number 13, 
Please. Number 12. Everything is going to be okay. Number 11. Oh, you got me a corn dog too? You shouldn't have, buddy. Number 10. I don't know. I know a lot of people who need to say that. My sister. <laughs> Number 9. You're so awesome, I named my dog after you. Wait, wait, wait. That could hurt someone's feelings. I mean, boat. I named my boat after you. Wait, who even had the boat? You're so awesome, I legally changed my name to yours. Wait, that's super creepy. It, it, just tell people they're awesome and mean it. Number eight. Hello, person I've never met before. Here's a high five. <laughs> Number seven. My sports team is not always the best sports team. It takes a big man to say that. Number six. Nothing. Sometimes that's the best thing you can say. Number five. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, but it's just really funny. <laughs> Number four. I disagree with you, but I still like you as a person who is a human being, and I'll treat you like that. Because if I didn't, it would make everything bad, and that's what lots of people do, and it's lame. I need a water break, y'all. It's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be mean. Number three, sometimes you just gotta scream. <laughs> Number two, life is tough, but so are you. Sometimes we all need to be reminded to keep going. Number one, something nice, anything. If you can't think of anything nice to say, you're not thinking hard enough. So what about you? What do you think people should say more often? Leave a comment below and let's hear it. Oh, and I got a bonus one for you. Something that we should say more often? Let's dance. real reason why we interact with people is because we care. Let's have the, the courage to stand up and, and connect with those people. So we just need to remember that uh, caring is the root of all of our courage. If we care enough about it, we're going to do it. We'll confront those fears, we'll transform, we'll, we'll take the action necessary to do it, and in the long run, we'll be a better person for it. Um, and just don't let those first impressions to demonstrate that you know a lot of us is really tight. <laughs> a lot of us have a lot of fears. What are some of those fears that, that bind us? You know, we talked about those. We have Meditech. We have you know fear of advancing, fear of, of uh, what other people think. We want to go back to these, and uh, want you to remember that we need to cut these fears that bind us. I forgot my scissors. So let's just go home. <laughs> She's gonna bring some around. So the first one is failure. Just don't, uh, you know, we we all fail. We're not perfect. So go ahead and and, uh, and just advance forward. We're gonna fail sometime, but just keep going. Um, rejection. The next one is change. And then. Don't have fear that you can be successful. Be positive about it. You can, you can do it. Have the courage to stand up to do what's right. Um, we have some little uh, items we're going to pass around. We've brought you some scissors that are actually workable scissors you can use at work to remind you to cut out the fears, to stand up and have courage and do what you're supposed to. Make one more reminder, real quick, about the the uh, um, courage stories. If you can just submit those to me before uh, the 24th of April, and then that way we have enough time to get them into the newspaper and and have time to recognize those individuals. So please just send them to my email, and that should be the that'll be the best way to do that. So, all right, great. Let's recognize one more time. Question and answers. What do you guys have? Anything on your mind besides the attendance post? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Anything? How come everybody looks at Clancy when the little guy says uh, it's okay to not have the best sports team? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, because my team is the best. They would have won something. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pam. Oh. Joe. Okay. Each month, as a reminder, um, we'd like for you to nominate somebody for either Mr. or Ms. Value. And so this last month, it was, the value was? Awareness. Awareness. So, um, we went through and uh, had several people who were nominated. And so Miss Awareness or Mrs. Awareness for this month is going to be Wendy Tomlin. She's a CNA on the med search floor. Um, they nominated her because she really is very much aware not only of uh, the patient's needs, but also of her staff. And seems to go quite a bit over and beyond, is very uh, aware of what's happening around her. So um, she's not here today, but we'll make sure we get her crowned and her sash to her the next time she's here. <laughs> and also, uh, a week ago we had the great awareness hunt that went on. We had 40 pictures around the facility and in the outlying clinics and asked staff if they found those to turn those in for a prize and we we're going to draw for um, gift certificates and so we have four $40 gift certificates and our winners are Tammy Simone from the Alpine Clinic, Amory Coho, who was here, there she is still, um, from Environmental Services, Amber Peak from Pharmacy and Pam Clinton from Administration. So let's congratulate those guys. Thank you so much. Is to courage in the four cornerstones, watch your fellow co workers, especially since we're you know, starting up Meditech next month. Who's got the courage to stand up to it and fight it? The, uh, fight through the problem. Sorry, that's <laughs> Just go with the flow. The nomination box is right up front on the volunteer's desk, so if you've got something you'd like to nominate, um, fill it out, put it in there, and uh, we'll look at that at the end of next month when we introduce our next value. So, thank you. And the two winners that Clancy helped me draw today were Paula Lancaster and Hannah Lancaster. Paula oh, Lancaster. Lancaster. <laughs> Wait, and just to let you know, Sunday the 30th is National Doctors' Day, so I'm sure sometime this week you'll let the doctors know how much you appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, cool.